So, I was on Facebook this week, and you know, uh, I was going through some photos, and I know what some people are thinking, oh no, I should have took those photos, some of those photos down, you know? Uh, but no, I don't, I'm not spying on you to see who's, you know, who's living a holy life or not, because I could care less, you're not that important. And I, I hate those people that go, I'm not on Facebook, I'm too busy, yeah, please. You know those people that say, I'm not on Facebook because I'm too busy? BS. Okay, everybody, if you have time to go to the bathroom, you have time to go on Facebook, right? And say, I'm on the bathroom and, and update your status. But anyways, I was, you know, I was on Facebook this week, um, you know, and uh, I was looking through the 180 fan page. And by the way, if you have not joined the 180 fan page, this is what I have to say about you. W-I-W-W. What is wrong with you? You're like, what is that? That's clever. I know. <laughs> Abbreviations. What is wrong with you? Yeah, sign up for the 180 fan page. Why? Because that's a great way to begin to, to study the story of Jesus. Okay? But anyway, so I was looking through the fan page, and you know, I, you know, I caught a couple of new people that became fans. And, uh, you know, I was looking through their profile. And Facebook has a certain type of format. And the format says, you know, the name, you know, workplace, hometown, you know, school, email. And then it has something very interesting. It says re religious, what? Views. And my religious view is I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But something caught my attention at the 180 fan page because a new person, this person's religious view was atheist. So I thought, that's arbitrary, Par that's a paradox way. So this person's religious views is atheist. So by definition, if your religious view is atheist, it should be blank, right? Because you have no religious views. But then at the same time, this person who her worldview or his worldview believes that what we believe is nonsense, she joins an organization full of people that believe in this nonsense. That doesn't make any sense. But why is her views or his view? And you're like, I wonder who it is. I'm gonna go look. <laughs> Don't. But uh, I know you're going to anyway. But who cares? But what is the tension between someone's views of? So someone says proudly on Facebook, I am an atheist or I am a Christian or you know, some people go apathetic. But what makes a person? What is the story behind someone being an atheist? But at the same time, being on a church fan page. I think this new book written by James Chung, and it says, uh, Christian, it says a, a true story, the title is A True Story, A Christianity Worth Believing In. I think what has happened is, for a lot of people, especially in metropolitan areas, whether you grew up in the church, whether you have no church context or uh, context in Christianity, um, one of the greatest problems, our story, my story, the gospel story, is lost in translation because 99% of the time, I was a, a communication professor and a preaching professor, so I understand that a lot of times it's not what is said, but how it's said. And people are turned off by that. And I think my suspicion is if people really heard the story the way it's supposed to be told, I think, and I believe this could start a revolution, a lot of people, smart people, would rethink Jesus. And a lot of people that already believe in Jesus would be strengthened in their faith. Because, let me tell you right now, I've judged and uh, presentations given C's and F's on presentation. And you go, why? And honestly, I had the manuscript in front of me, word for word manuscript, and their manuscript was excellent. Their text was excellent. They just really suck at talking, you know? I mean, how many people heard a really bad joke before? 99.9% .9 of the time. That joke is bad. And you probably heard the joke too, and you're like, yeah, hey, I like this one, I like this one. And that's why other people say, hey, tell that story, because it was funny once. But then sometimes people tell jokes, and it's just awkward, and it's just butchered. Why? It's not the joke, it's how you uh, tell it. 
Let me tell you what I think. I think why someone like him or her is on 180 fan page is because they were invited or forced by a friend, say, hey, hey, this church is pretty cool. Why don't you come? This person came and rethought what his or her's perception about the story is about. It's like, wait, this, this is a lot different than I thought. This is cool. The speaker is very handsome. <laughs> very cool guy, you know? He wears a lot of, a lot of purple, you know? And, and uh, so, so people are in this aspect, and you have a positive experience, and it now begins to make you rethink your stance on this story you thought you understood. And I'm telling you, it's not the story, it's how it's told. And why we started this new series, go down, right? Where's Jesus? A parody of Inspired By, where's the Wobbles picture books? Finally, I understand, Henry. Finally, a new series by Pastor Sam Kim. And, you know, for the next five years or so, we're going to be on this. I don't know. I'm kidding. But why we started this series is because I think, my suspicion, again, is that how it was told was bad. Christianity in our generation has a curse. All or most of our speakers, not to, you know, diss pastors or spiritual leaders, we become boring. We've made something boring that's the most fascinating book in history. And the most sold book in history, no longer people read it. Why? Because it's how we tell it. I want to talk about a Christianity worth believing in. I want to talk about how that Christianity is not about dogma, it's not about law, it's not about morality, it's not about becoming a good person because I hate the stigma. I mean, I am the worst Christian in the world if the stigma of being a Christian is being super nice. Because that's the stigma of Christianity. And even in public debates, when atheists like you know Dawkins and McGrath and, and Tim Keller and other people argue about faith, always Tim Keller and McGrath and all the theologians are just the nicest people in the world. I, 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 I don't really mean it that way, not to offend you. And then there's Dawkins, you are moronic. You are stupid for believing in this. Believing in God is like believing in the, you know, Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus when you grow up, but you're supposed to grow out of it. And so there's this new worldview crushing and antagonist and very antagonistic to the story. And there's these Christians that are very nice. I'm sorry. Uh, the whole point of this story about Jesus is that I am a douchebag. I am effed up. I am messed up. I am a John Wesley and John Newton wrote, I am a wretch. The whole point of scripture is pointing to a savior, the person named Jesus. Why do you need to be saved? But why? Because you need to learn how, you need to know how to, you know, wipe your hands before you eat and say how you do, you know, and, and be polite and be diplomatic. No, there's a savior in scripture because the overarching theme of human history is that we're people that, that are going to be destroyed if we are the boss of our own life. So we come to this place, where's Jesus? I want to tell the story from the very beginning. In a way, it's meant to be told. I think it would be very interesting. And I, I say this because I think you should send this to your friends and invite them in this conversation as you think about these things. But there are a couple of problems when we come to the questions, where's Jesus in creation? Because, you know, when you think of creation, you think of science. All right? So let's go down here. Um, so that's what we're going to tackle today. We're going to start from Genesis 1. And a lot of people try to read the Bible and start at Genesis, and they stop at Genesis 3. They're like, I can't read this anymore. But uh, the question is, so the series is, where's Jesus? Today we're going to tackle, where's Jesus in creation? And there are a couple problems when we come to Genesis. Because you're, first of all, Western. You're, you're, you studied, and because most people here are Asians, you're geeky. And you like C++, and you like programming. We have someone that actually studied... Uh, 
from MIT that studied some nerdy, really nerdy stuff, but <laughs> not to mention that stuff. But uh, you know, but typically, you know, a, a lot of people, not to be stereotypical, which I mean, I think stereotypes are funny because they're mostly true, you know. But uh, you know, you, you you probably excelled in science class, and uh, we talk about the beginning. The beginning of how everything started, and you know, in, in in New York and in metro areas in the East Coast where the Ivy Towers stand, you know, evolution and the Big Bang Theory. That's a good show, by the way. And um, you know, and we talk. We start with science because Western civilization started what we call right modernism and the scientific method. So we think science, but here's the problem with that: when you go to Genesis, science or modernism, it's only about 200 years old, or 150 years old. For about 4,000 years of written civilization, no one believes in that. So when you come to Genesis, you can't think scientifically, because this is one of the, this Christian struggle with this, and a lot of liberals in New York, and the East Coast, and metropolitan areas, all over the world struggle with this question, is how can I reconcile what I know to be true from this book. Because if this book, as you say, is the word of God, the word of God, <laughs> it's, and you know, here it is, and, and here's the problem, you come to this book, and you go, well, it's the word of God, so um, it's supposed to be infallible, it's supposed to be true in every way, it's literal in every way, but here's the thing, you see, there's a lot of smart evangelicals and Christians in many different you know, sects and streams that have different interpretation of the Bible, some are literal, and some of you in here, but you might think take the Bible literally, and some parts are, some parts you know, and some parts are allegorical, some parts are you know narrative, some parts are letters. But think about this, okay? Genres always tell stories. You, we, we tell you know stories through genres, whether it's poems, whether it's comedy, whether it's literature in different ways. You see, when you want to tell a story, you have to choose. Like for example, um, uh, the show Friends, or how about, how many people like 24? Crap Bauer, right? <laughs> you don't watch just one show, you watch like all four seasons in one night and you're going to work or school, you're like, wow, <laughs> that was cool, <laughs> you know? and. Um, you know how many writers there are writing 24? You know, you know why these people make tons of money and why you know Fox charges you know these commercial advertisers millions of dollars to advertise when Crack Bauer is on because they know people are addicted to Crack <laughs> Bauer. You know, so that, that's, it, it, there are hundreds of white writers. No one people think that when you read and you, you, you watch 24 and every line is clever and you're like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> you know? And it's like, wow, so witty. I wish life was like that. Well, your life could be if there were a hundred writers writing every line. So when you come to scripture, you have 66 books, many different writers, telling all the same story of one unifying theme. So of course, when you want to tell a story, you can't tell the story just from just you know one genre. You have to tell it from many. Why? Because you're telling the same story, but in different ways. So when you come to Genesis, Moses is writing in 1400 BC. Obviously, he wasn't freaking there at creation. Moses didn't go to creation like God transported him back in the beginning of time, millions of years. And Moses was there, was like, wow, let there be light. You know? No. It's 1400 BC. He is from the inspiration of God. Just because it's literary doesn't mean it's not true. When you tell any story in poems, when if I tell my wife a poem, which I never will, because I'm not that type of person, I'm more of a gift person, you know, here, bottom line. But if I had a poem, a poem could be true in every sense. It's a different genre of my love, but I don't have to tell a story about what happened. I can tell the essence of truth is formed in that literary genre. That's the way we communicate. So when I say something is literary, I mean that the authors of scripture took an idea of truth from who God is and revealed it this way. So if you're a literalist, or if you're you know, figurative and you want to read scripture in a certain way, you have to read it from the author's intent. Moses written, wrote it in a certain way, right? So when we start from here, here's what you have to focus on. 
Okay? If you want to understand verse 1 to 25, you have to understand verse 26. And I want everybody to read it with me, okay? Verse 26 says, Then God let us in our in our in our likeness. So Moses writes Genesis. Remember I told you last week in the desert in 1400 BC. It's impossible for Moses to be at creation. Right? Because creation is millions of billions of years old. Moses is writing this in 1400 BC. So he has to tell a story about what God has done, right? And people think about, you know, the people the number one objection against the Bible, the Bible is just a man 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 read book. You know, man wrote it. You can't trust man. I like that the Bible is a man-made book. Because every man telling a story has to choose a literary device. Like, for example, watch this. The word here in verse 3 to verse 5, it says that what? God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And then it was evening. Day was the morning. The first Okay, here it is. The word day in Hebrew is nom. Say nom. 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 The word Hebrew for day is nam. Nam is not an exact appointed amount of time. Nam is an indefinite amount of time, meaning it's open-ended. Meaning that day can be translated millions of years. Because God doesn't need to think about physics when he's creating stuff because he's God, stupid. God doesn't go, okay, how the hell does this formula work of creating matter? How do I split matter? E equals MC squared? Oh, well, I, I didn't create Einstein yet. How am I supposed to? God's not doing that. God is God. God knows just by his ontological essence what it is. God, the Bible is not a book of what, you know, how the process of things are. The Bible is a book of what is because God is. And if God wasn't just is, you shouldn't believe in him. So the word day gives you room to understand how creation was actually created to reconcile with science. Like for example, let's go down here. Focus on day. Let's go down. Okay. Now, I've made movies before, The Open Door, the story that can change everything. And you know, listen, before you create any movie, any sitcom, like for example, how many people like the sitcom 24? Crack Bauer. People are addicted to, 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 you know, 24. People watch it. There's, I don't know anyone that watches 24 just one episode at a time. People watch it forever. Like, I know people that watch seasons of it and went to work at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. I know people that, you know, <laughs> slept through days of watching 24. 24. And you go, you think about how 24 was created. Let me just tell you the production of how movies and sitcoms are created. The studio hires hundreds of writers. When you think of 24 and why it's so action-packed and so clever, and those cliffhangers, the whole world, the fate of the world is in Jack Bauer's hands, and how, why they could make you addicted to it like it's crack, it's because there are 100 writers using different perspective every three seconds, the lens are changing, focus. Why? They're telling you a story to bring you in. But Ken, and when we made the open door, it was about Tay's life. I can't tell you Tay's life exactly the way it was. It's, it's, there's 25 years of his life. I'm supposed to tell you exactly when he was born, what he did when he was born. It, it, in, in order for the law of communication to matter, I would have to, what, condense it. So when Genesis says, God created light in the first day. It's not saying literally created in the first day. He's saying that God created it for the sake of communication, and Moses is just literally telling you that. Okay? It's just so. The point is not how long it took. The point is what? That God made it. So when you come to Genesis, you have to understand it this way. First, if you want to know where Jesus is in the Bible, where Jesus is in creation, read this for me. Creation is really more what? You go, Pastor, where's the conversation? What are you talking about? So let's go back to that passage. Let's go up, not down. 
It's creation is more of a con conversation than it is, right, a science. Look, put that back up up there. So watch. Then God said, let us make man in what? In? Okay, ours is what? Is it singular or is it plural? Who is God talking to? <laughs> hey, Barney, come here, you know? I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. God, come, come on. I mean, let us so the whole, the whole definition of God is that God was preeminent before creation, meaning no one created him. The Greek word for nothing is ex nihilo, meaning creation came out of nothing. That, not, that something came out of nothing. So when, you, when Moses is writing this, what he's trying to tell you, literally, it, did this event happen? Of course it happened. Of course God created it. The, the Bible's not telling you the process, but it's giving you the room for process. And now I'm going to go deeper. So, for example, evolution. You go, Pastor Sam, do we believe in evolution in 180? Of course we do. You're like, really? We came from monkeys? No, I don't believe in macroevolution. I believe in microevolution. Darwin developed the idea of microevolution. What's the difference? Microevolution says, what this is consistent with this verse. Read verse 24 with me, okay? And God said, let the... Okay, you got to catch this. It says, let, God said, let the land living creatures according to their... Okay, I want, I want you to catch this. God said, let the land produce living creatures. The land, meaning all the species that you see came from what? The, the ground. God commanded the ground. Now, did God use physics? Did God use the process of microevolution? The way we discovered that species change within their own kinds. That's what Darwin developed. That's what Darwin discovered about 150 years ago. That's what he discovered, that species variate in their environment. But it's consistent with scripture. Moses says that God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. We believe in microevolution. We believe God used it as a process. What we discovered 150 years ago, God already knew a billion years ago. Why? Because he's God, stupid. We were just discovering how he did it. That's all. Sometimes I don't understand some atheists. Like, you ever, I mean, and you know what? I have no, promise, no problem with atheists. I respect them. You, go, you do? Yeah. Because I don't understand how some atheists who believe in evolution come at me with this type of pompous arrogance. Like I'm a stupid moron for believing in the, that there's a designer, there's a creator, right? He comes to me and goes, like Bill Maher, for example. <laughs> the first, there's that chalking thing. <laughs> you, and it's really more language than evidence. They're like, you believe that? It's like more mockery. You actually believe? that God created the world. Everybody knows it's, ev by empirical evidence, Darwin proved that we come from monkeys. So I go, wait, wait, okay, so, okay, so uh, what you're telling me is you're proud. You are, so it's proud and smart to believe that my grand, 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 grandfather was an ape, a primate, and you're proud of that. I go, oh yeah, I never thought about it like that. I go, wait, wait, wait. So, uh, you see, and, and this is what I say. I go, if God, cre if God used macroevolution even, right? If a designer, and you come from monkeys or primates, as Darwin suggests, right, in the end, then that would be humorous, right? If God used the process of macroevolution and let monkeys roam the earth, and then we came like that, and then eventually we became humans, and we got to use hands, and looked in the mirror, and knew that I was good looking, or you were good looking, or ugly, one or the other, self-consciousness. I mean, if God did that, if God used macroevolution as a process to create you, that would be funny. I would understand 
understand why God would do that. It was humorous. It's kind of like why God created giraffes. I mean, what is, their, what is the point of their existence? What, I mean, the only point of giraffe's existence, I, I see, I don't know how they help anybody. You laugh at them. I bet you God from heaven looks at giraffes, <sighs> got a long neck. You know, you got a long neck, you know, and they're laughing about it. So if God used macroevolution to create you from apes or primates, that would be humorous. But if you're telling me that by probability I came from a monkey, that's just pathetic. That I'm, I'm from a primate by probability? Oh my gosh, is that humiliating? If God did it on purpose, at least it would be funny. But if it's by probability of billions of years, and you think that's beautiful? Are you erotic? And then you tell me I'm stupid for believing in an omnipotent God with unlimited power that could create me and design me when everything around me has a design. So Genesis gives you a clear picture of microevolution, meaning you can be a Christian and believe in evolution, not the jump that cultish Darwin people jump from the kinds, because look, look what it says, right? How many times does verse 24 to verse 25 say kind? Let's count. Ready? Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, one, right? Each according to its kind, right? And it says, God made the wild animals according to their kinds. I think there's a point there, no? That the variations from natural selection in Darwin about species variating and changing within their own kind, there's direct link to that. But, you know, if really evolution was true, macroevolution was true, why doesn't primates uh, become humans now? People are like, oh. Yeah, why don't they? Because it's not true, you moron! <laughs> and this is what I want to suggest. And I, you know, I'm not telling you what just this thing is true. I'm just saying that both sides, the right-wing fundamentalist that says the Word of God says the Bible is literal if the Bible says seven days is seven days. And then there's the fundamental evolutionist, right? Evolution is true in it. So these both morons, they're both morons. I want you to come to the middle, be a thinking person, look at what Moses is saying, try to reconcile what's real, and accept the fact that Moses is not writing a science book. He's telling you a story, a true story. He's trying to write and tell the second generation, the people dying in the desert, struggling in the desert, believing in Yahweh that they have purpose in life. That they can believe that the creator of the universe is with them. And that's why there are no dinosaurs recorded in Genesis. You go, why? If it's the word of God, and everything is literal and infallible, how come there's no, because come on, how come there's no dinosaurs? They existed. Well, dude, it's just like saying, how come the Bible doesn't, they, they don't talk about iPhones? How come they didn't have cellular phones? Well, because it wasn't invented yet. You see, the Bible, Genesis is a historical book. Moses is the author choosing a literary form. If 24 has 60, like hundreds of writers, the Bible has 66 writers telling all the same story, pointing to Jesus. Moses is just one of them, one of the writers telling the story. He is telling the story, not to you, not to me, but to his people. So why the heck, and you know what? He didn't know if there were dinosaurs. Why? Because it's 1400 BC. Last time I checked, we found that dinosaurs existed a couple hundred years ago. Like maybe 150, and how we do that? Well, you see, we invented machinery that can freaking dig stuff. Because if Moses was gonna dig the ground, it would take him a couple million years. So, you see, Moses is not writing scientifically because the culmination of history here, he doesn't know science. He knows what man has discovered until this point. The Bible is not a scientific book. It's a what? A faith book. It's telling you how things are, how it is. And that's why sometimes you can't reconcile it. But here you can. Right? 
So that's how you understand it. Kind day. So the day gives you an indefinite amount of time, gives you the room for microevolution. You could believe that you could be a Christian. And if some freaking moron comes to you and says, you believe that? Let's turn to Genesis 1. Let me tell you what the word day means, moron. Let me tell you what verse 25 says about what Darwin said about natural selection. And then they go, yeah, yeah, but it's, you believe that? It's like the tooth fairy. It's like Santa Claus. You go, show me the proof where one species jumped to another species ever recorded empirically in history from Darwin or in history. And they can't give you the answer because uh, the primates don't turn humans now. And you know, if you're not stupid, you'll go, granted. So science can't prove that God exists, but science cannot prove if God doesn't. For example, you know, I want to go into a little deeper here. I think I, I, I have you here, and I, maybe I'll try to break through some stuff. Right now, we live in what we call a postmodern world. Say postmodern. Post You're like, what the hell does that mean? Postmodern means we are post logic, post reason. What the hell does that mean? It means that it doesn't mean we throw away logic, because when you throw away a logic, what you get is a show like Jersey Shore. <laughs> You see, Jersey Shore, on line 24, they rhyme, they don't have writers because you cannot create that type of stupidity. <laughs> you, you just can't. Jersey Shore, it's its own evolution. <laughs> there, it just exists. The writers cannot, the, let me, the writers, even celebrities are well by it because no one could think of those things they say. Right? When, when Suki says, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bartender. I do great things. This is beneath me. <laughs> you can't make up lines like that. Now, 24, you need writers because they say kind of profound things, right? See, here it is. Here it is. If you want to become... And, and the whole point of a postmodern world is that now we don't throw away logic. Meaning we don't throw away reason and critical thinking. It means that reason from the Enlightenment, which is only 150 years old, and how people started distancing themselves from God, is we basically we came to a point 150 years later saying that reason and logic cannot answer everything. And this primitive idea of God is where we come back to. And Genesis 1 tells you things that reason and logic cannot answer. We come back to the same place. This is because God is having a conversation. With who? Well, let's go down. I want to tell you my ultimate favorite show. It says, then let, what? let us make man in our image, in our likeness. It's two plurals there. Let's go down here. Now, this is my punchline. Now, this show is one of my favorite shows. Well, not anymore. I hate it. I have a love-hate relationship with How I Met Your Mother. Because the whole show is about Ted telling his kids in 2020 or something like that how he met his mother. But the frustrating thing after 5,000 seasons of the show is that they never show you the mother. <laughs> they talk about her. They start with her. They narrate about her. This season, when we thought we saw her, where this god-awful show, we saw her foot. This season, we saw her foot. We saw who she might be. This show was all about the mother, Ted's, right, the kid's mother, but she never shows up. But there's, for the next, the last four or five seasons, there are references to her. She never shows up, but the show's about her. There's foreshadowings of her. You, basically, you get to know her without even seeing her. You get to hear about her. And every time Ted dates a girl, you go, is that her? And you know it's not, because if it's her, the show would end. <laughs> Creation. Very similar. The ultimate question of this series was, where is Jesus in creation? And if you went into Genesis and you turn it into a real reality, if creation was really happening, and you said, where is Jesus? I don't see Jesus. Where is he? This is what the angels would say. Shh. Don't 
mean to be rude. But he's in the middle of a conversation. When God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, Jesus, who, where is Jesus? God, in redemptive history, is talking to who? His son. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they're the ones be like, yo, giraffes, funny, let's do it. Let's. And then, you know, I could see the Father be like, yo, we, we need to make his neck a little longer. Let, no, 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 longer, longer, longer. Well, why? And, and the Holy Spirit's like, yo, Jesus, I think that's not right. Jesus like, shut up. <laughs> I'm God, I can do what I want, right? And there are animals in the sea that you cannot see. There are species we don't know about. Why? Because God created creation out of a community. You see, at the, at the beginning of Genesis, you have no idea who God is. Moses is introducing who God is, the preeminent person that existed before all things, ex nihilo. Jesus is at creation chilling. Just like how with your mother, the whole Old Testament talks about him, references to him, foreshadows him, but you never see him until the New Testament. And then Jesus says, all the prophets, all the teachers of the law, long to see this day. Jesus is having a conversation with, with the Father about what, what to create. And then he decided to create you. Same conversation. You see, Jesus, if you can find Jesus from what Frank Sinatra said, right? If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And Jay-Z popularized that too. He copied him. If you can find Jesus here at creation, you can find him anywhere. You can find him today. You can help your friends find him. Because let me tell you, I, I prove it to you. Jesus is at every Book of the Bible. Because the Bible is about him. Today, you might be a person that's thinking, rethinking Jesus. Because you thought you were smart, you're atheist, you, you believed in the evolution, the atheist fundamentalism. Evolution! Or once you were the right wing fundamentalist, the word of God! It's literal. I want you to come in the middle, become a, become a thinking, critical person. Realize that both of these are errors, and realize that the Bible is a literary book talking about actual events, yes, but written by people God used to tell his story. And here you see Jesus. Amen? That's where Jesus is, in the middle of a conversation. So let's all stand together. As you know, we started this series. Where is Jesus in the Bible? Where is Jesus in Genesis? And we're going to continue to look here. This is a series designed for people that grew up in the church, that are attending schools or have gone to schools, to <coughs> reconcile certain things that you're struggling with, that you might be struggling with. Uh, I think we're going to go through this. It's going to help us really alleviate those type of uh, just nagging questions that's there that seem to question our faith. So I think that's good. These are series designed to enter other people in the conversation about Christ and how the Bible points to him as the ultimate culmination. Um, so please invite people and give this on YouTube to people. And again, I'm going to be the power of repetition, okay? Join 180 Church fan page. You go, why? why? What's the big deal? Well, because it's the easiest way to raise money. I'm kidding. No. no, it really is. Come on. I mean, I put up, I put up stuff on Facebook. I mean, in literally in a day, we raised like ten thousand dollars for the Father's Project. Okay. Um, people, people say I'm too busy, but they they sign on for a second, and then if you're on fan page, you will see the post, which which is which is designed to make you feel guilty about forgetting stupid things. Okay. But I mean, it, it really is the best way to communicate. So please sign up. Uh, for one, and if you go, well, how do I get that? You go, just type in 180 Church, and we're the beautiful design logo, 180 Church on it. So there we go, sign on in. Um, uh, secondly, we don't collect offering during service because we have a lot of people visit that are 
I'm looking for Jesus and we don't want them to uh, pay. And we say admission is free. But admission isn't. So if, for members, give online or you can give them the information. So that would be it for today. And uh, there are also small groups. Stay with me. I'm going to pray for all these things. And then we'll be uh, on our way. Father, we want to come before you today. We want to thank you for this series about Jesus and pointing to you. We pray that many people would come to faith through this vehicle. Um, we want to pray for your blessing on it. We want to pray for our faith to be strengthened and for some people to rethink Jesus and come to faith in you. Uh, secondly, we thank you for the resources you've given us to advance the kingdom of God and the gospel. We pray that continue to happen. And we pray God continually in small groups, people would enter the conversation about these things. We thank you in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys have a great Sunday.